know How could you I was for or against you Religion is division It splits you I still believe in me And she and I believe I believe in you so much. Mr. Adam Fightfield right here, everybody. Desmond Whitney, watch Shira Wagerstone. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Wow. Hmm. Are they wonderful? Not only are they wonderful, they're flexible. They did not know until just recently that they would be special music today, so I'm grateful for them showing up. And I think they've done this before, so I think, that, I think we're okay. So it's good. So grateful. As you may or may not know, we've just uh, had our annual convention for the Centers for Spiritual Living, our international organization. And lo and behold, if they didn't decide to hold it in Salt Lake City, yay! So, I, I, you know, it was really wonderful, and I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge some folks. You know, I got a call from my friend Sally, who's also the co-chair of the committee, just saying, you know, I just want to say what, how wonderful your group is, all the people that showed up to volunteer and to make everybody feel welcome and to do mundane and not-so-mundane things. And Raj supported me in doing the morning chapel at 8 a.m. <laughs> it was amazing. You know, so I just wanted to know, you to know, that you are loved and valued and appreciated in the world, not just by me. So it's great. It was really interesting, though, to note to self, because um, I was thinking, well, that's cool. The convention's here. I'll just do my life and do the convention, whereas I'd normally block out the time and go someplace, and it turns out you can't do that. Uh, so <laughs> it'd be a very full week, but, you know, I got to see what I needed to see and hang out with the people I need to hang out, and still teach my classes and all. It was good. But we're in this um, story about awakening to our spiritual magnificence. It's our theme for the day, theme for the month. And I kind of love this idea that we are spiritually magnificent whether we like it or not. We are spiritually magnificent whether we are awake to it or not. We are spiritually magnificent whether we recognize it or not. So the job then is not to become more, it is to recognize who we are and to allow more. <laughs> Sharing with the group, you know, I, my work these days is really at a deeper level of trying to stop make, making things happen to simply making things welcome to simply making the life that I desire to be welcome, to create a vessel and a vehicle through which the divine can make itself known. Because you see, we are not, contrary to popular belief, separate from God, not separate from divine life. How do I know this? Because we're alive. <laughs> we didn't create this life. It expresses itself through us, right? And so, now I know spiritually many of us grew up with a concept of an of a infinite power, a, usually a dude, you know, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> men get to do all the cool stuff, right? 
Um, you know, with a God that lived in a cloud and, you know, m- messes with our lives or guides our lives or directs our lives. And so this evolution of thought is to recognize that indeed we're not working with a power and a presence that lives outside of ourselves, but rather a power and a presence that is everywhere present, always available, that is expressing itself in and through and as us. So in that work, we're starting to allow that life to be more fully orbed, more fully expressed. Now, there's a number of ways that this awakening occurs. Things in our lives change. And so sometimes it's really easy and it's lovely and it's welcome. Uh, We were just having a conversation in class the other night about, you know, it's okay for our lives to be easy. Believe me? (laughs) You don't look convinced. You're like, oh, that's a nice thought. No, but really, I'm... I say unto you, let me put it into scriptural terms, I say unto you, it's okay for your life to be easy, right? It's okay for our lives just to flow. You know, sometimes we hold this belief that says, unless we struggle for it, it doesn't really count. Because we all know you've got to work hard to succeed, to get ahead, da, 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 da. What if you don't? What if you could work smart? What if you could work joyously and easily? What if you could just show up as the presence of the divine and allow life to unfold? You know, sometimes life just is easy. Uh, And, you know, I call it that point. Sometimes when we're moved into a new state of being or something happens and life just kind of unfolds. I was telling this story about some friends of mine who, many years ago, we founded a community in, in Irving, Texas. In fact, I had lunch with my friend Larry this week, who was my, one of my practitioner students, who's now stu- the minister there. So I'm reminded on a daily basis of just how old I am and how long I've been around. But um, it was lovely. And, and they were really instrumental in us helping get that started. And they had great skill sets that they brought to the table. And, and they, were, they were just a pillar of our community. And um, what, they went off on vacation. And um, they came back and they said, you're not going to believe what happened. I said, OK, try me. And they said, we were in Estes Park, so lovely. And we thought, we've always liked, wanted to live in the mountains. And we can. They bought a house, went and saw this house, put an offer on it, came back, said, well, we should sell our house, put the house on the market on Friday, and on Saturday it was sold. And they were off and running, living their life. And I was like, cool for you. Um, (laughs) Secretly, I was saying, what the, you know, right? Part of me is like, you know, when I said follow your vision, I didn't mean like in any other state or city than here, you know, (laughs) since modified some of my teachings to say, I want you to follow your dream. I want you to follow your heart as long as it's within a 10 mile radius. (laughs) Then it's approved, right? But you see, sometimes that happens for us when we start opening to our greater possibility, to the greater vision of who we are, to what's trying to happen for us. It begins to take on its own life, and things fall into place, and things happen, and all of a sudden, we go where we are called to go. And it's easy, and it's joyous, and it's fun. That's how I always know sometimes like I'm in the zone. So there's a, there's a thought that we sometimes have that... Everything, then once we kind of embrace that idea that everything should be easy, everything should just flow, that we can just sit around and ohm our life into being, which is great. But Meister Meister Eckhart, a great 12th century mystic, said this to us, and I think there's some value for us to hear it today. He says, the shell must be cracked apart if what is within it is to come out. For if you want the kernel, you must break the shell. And I thought about this so often, about how we are little God seeds running around. And the amazing thing about seeds is they have this self-enclosed being. They have this shell that holds them in place. And there's an intelligence and a wisdom that is resident within that shell that's always there. 
In fact, it's fascinating. They were I was reading something a while back about that they had taken, they found some seeds that had been stored in the desert. They'd been stored in one of the tombs, of the Pharaoh's tombs. And they thought, I wonder what would happen if we planted these things. And they grew, right? They put them in soil. They put water. Thousands of years old, these seeds are sitting there just being dormant. And then the conditions became right and life unfolded. And so uh, Meister Eckhart is saying to us, if we want the kernel to come forth, we must crack the shell because here's what happens. So you have this perfectly lovely contained seed and it's just hanging out there. But then when growth happens, have you ever seen these videos of watching a plant grow and there's this seed and then all of a sudden it bursts and something starts to move towards the surface and something starts to move towards the root system and life is happening. But you know, you kind of, I always have this image of like, what does that feel like? You imagine the other seeds in the row going, oh my God, you know what just happened to Bob? <laughs> He's a mess. He's got things growing out of him. I don't know what is going on. <laughs> right? <laughs> Life's happening. Right? But you think about for 2,000 years, I've been in perfectly contained. What is going on with me? Right? So recognize that when life begins to happen, very often the old must fall away in order for the new to emerge and to come about. So as I said, it comes about in welcome ways. We, we, we get, go into a new relationship, a profound relationship. We might marry another and we say, wow, isn't this beautiful? Of course, you get to grow into that relationship, yes or yes? <laughs> right? There's really very few that they just ride off happily ever into the sunset, right? It's like, oh, wow, we're going to have to learn how to be together as one, right? And that's wonderful. It's welcoming. And a new child is born, and you know your life has changed, but something is awakened. Something is awakened in, in this new life that has joined us. That's a beautiful and wonderful thing, and yet you know your life is never going to be quite the same. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, as it's screaming at you, yet one again, this precious little bundle of light that you were so joyous about is less beautiful at 3 o'clock in the morning when it's screaming at you and you've not had any sleep, right? But it doesn't matter because something else is awakened. And so that's part of the process. So very often in our, in, our, in our visioning and in our learning to listen to allowing life to be life through us, welcome things happen and we know something's awakened and it's good and it's beautiful and it feels like flow. But there's another way that life happens for us, that that kernel gets burst. And it is the unwelcome. It's the unexpected. It's the loss of that relationship. It's the death of a loved one. It's the ending of a business or it's an ending of an idea of any kind that didn't happen. You think, oh, wow, this isn't good. This isn't my plan. This isn't what I want, right? And yet, when we begin to realize and recognize what we say all the time is true, that we are spiritual beings, we are spiritual beings, and the spiritual essence of who we are it remains constant, remains the same, goes on and on and on and on. Even though the form through which our spiritual essence expresses is always evolving, always changing. That six or eight pound baby that you showed up, you, uh, up as however many years ago, you don't look the same. Some of you grew up. Some of you grew out. You know, we, some of you did both, right? Um, but we continue to grow and evolve, and yet the essence of that child remains the same throughout the journey until eventually we lay down this earthly coil, as they say, and we move into the next experience of our life. But the challenge is very often because we are the way we are, we get attached. 
We get attached to how things are supposed to be. We get attached to that it's this way. You see, sometimes people will ask me, they're like, so, so what are you? You know, I'll say I'm a minister or something. They're like, well, so what are you? And I say, oh, I'm a Christian Buddhist. <laughs> sometimes I tell them more. Sometimes I just walk away and watch them kind of twitch. It's always good, you know, right? Because they're like, wait a minute. You got to be one or you got to be the other. You got to be something. But you see, I really do believe in the principles of the Christ self that are taught. Uh, and of course, I haven't evolved thought. I like to think evolved, but maybe it's not. I have a thought around that the Christ is the presence of the divine that is awakened, not the person that Jesus was, although it was fully orbed and embodied in him. So, but I believe in those teachings and those principles. I come back time and again to the teachings of, of Jesus. They resonate with my soul. And yet I also have a spiritual practice of meditation that is Buddhist in nature, that is always about practicing being present in the now and, and, and focusing on the breath and recognizing the impermanence of things. You see, this great teaching from the, from the East, from the Buddha, is that our suffering lies in our resistance or our attachment. Now, in case you've never practiced resistance or attachment, let me explain to you what this is. You see, we think, have you ever had that moment like, oh, okay, I've arrived. I've got all the pieces in place. Let's just stay here. But life never cooperates. It's like, oh, I think I'll continue to evolve. I think I'll continue to change. I think I'll continue. And so it's breathing into the new moment and the new moment of possibility. We're the ones that put the label to whether it's a good or bad experience when perhaps it's just life happening. You see, I have a fundamental belief as I've spent, oh, so many years doing this. I'm, I'm becoming profoundly aware of how many years I've been doing this. Um, last week I spoke, you know, we had visitors from CSL and one of the young people in our audience was, um, who was, our, was a kid that I took to camp his very first camp, he was 11 years old. Threw a rock up in the air or some kids were throwing rocks or something. But anyways, one of them landed on his head. And you know, if you ever cut your head, it... And so that was our first experience. I don't know if it knocks sense into him or out of him, but he's now our community spiritual leader. He serves as the chairperson of the leadership council for the entire Centers for Spiritual Living. It's a remarkable thing. And so... I'm aware that I've been doing this for a long time. So this week, I'm on my little Facebook thing, and um, some of these kids have a little group from all of us that used to go to camp together, and somebody posted these pictures from 1985. <laughs> and there's all these kids, and I'm recognizing the name, and kind of recognizing the face, and I'm like, who's that kid? Who's that kid? And I looked at this one, and I was like, he looks really familiar. Who's that? And then I was like, oh my God, it's me. <laughs> <clears throat> Rockin', I might say, the Miami Vice look. <laughs> right? I mean, whatever happened to unstructured jacket with shoulder pads? <laughs> right? Oh my God, I was like, oh my God. I'm, I'm going to have to bring that. I'm going to bring this before and after photo for you one of these days. Just so... I say that because I have been teaching this for a long time. And, and, and so what I know is that when we hear the principles of science of mind, sometimes we move into this idea that once we get our consciousness right, then it all just flows and it's all just perfect and everything's wonderful. And we get to have heaven on earth. Yes. If we were just doing it right. But some of you aren't doing it right. No, here's what I would have you know, is that it's never about that. Because while that is true, while we influence and are co-creative beings with this universal intelligence, you see, we did not create our life, but we can co-create with the one life according to our own thought, our own belief, our own way of being in the world.
That what is true, I believe, is that the way we think creates a mold for the universe to fulfill itself. See, Jesus said to us very often that it is done unto us as we believe. Key word, as we believe. And so the power that we have is not to create life. The power that we have is to co-create with the one life. And our lives can be either expansive and uplifting and joyous and wonderful because that is our consciousness, or life can be limiting and struggle and all of that because that too is our consciousness. Life in that sense is impersonal to us. So as we are in this evolution, what I know and what I'm convinced of is that there is a higher order of things that we know not of. It's our soul's journey. Sometimes people talk about their soul's contract, that, we've, that we are having this experience of life at this plane of existence for our soul's unfoldment. And it is both to experience joy and fulfillment. It is also to experience pain and discomfort. You're not being punished. It's just the unfolding contract. And so, as we say, sometimes bad things happen to good people. And it may or may not have anything to do with their consciousness. It's just life unfolding. But ultimately, this is why I love this Buddhist practice of practicing non-attachment, is to be present in the moment as it turns out that some of the things that appear at the time to be less than whole, less than gracious, less than loving, are actually the seed cracking open so that the lovely and more pure can evolve and express. But we don't know it. We're like the seed going, what is going on with me? You know, I come back time and again to that the imagery of the caterpillar. And the caterpillar is lovely. I love caterpillars. They're really cute. Uh, you know, and they <laughs> climb around, and they're all gooey and wonderful. And, you know, and, and they're beautiful in their, own, in their own way. But this amazing thing happens for a caterpillar that at some point the divine says, hey, there's a bigger, better plan for you. And all I want you to do is go off into this, create this little shell for yourself, go hang out there for a few minutes, and then when you're done with that, you get to be a butterfly. And people will go, wow. But here's what actually happens. When the caterpillar goes into the shell, into the cocoon, it literally dissolves. Now, if you're ever in that state, <laughs> you're thinking, no, I'm not cool with dissolving, right? And what I also know is that if you as a well-meaning person say, we got to get that caterpillar out of there and you open that shell before its time is ready, you kill the butterfly. So. In the emergence, there is a dissolution and a recreation and then a reemergence of our true self. But we don't always recognize that in the process. Having done this for many years and having watched people go through various journeys, and sometimes they just feel horrible, and yet... When we trust life and we're willing to not attach to what it should be, how it's supposed to be, and allow what is trying to emerge to emerge, then out of that comes the beautiful, magnificent butterfly that can do things that the caterpillar could never do. It's just hard to recognize that when you're a gooey mess. <laughs> this is why we need each other. Right? Not to open the cocoon, but to just be there and love us 
as we go through our soul's emergence. Life is happening, and it's happening in ways that we love, and it's happening in ways that we don't love. Life doesn't care. It's still going to keep happening, right? So this is why my Buddhist practice is like, oh, just be, be with this breath. Be present with what is. Be present with what is, right? Because life will continue to evolve. Now, what I also know is that the more deeply grounded in spirit I am, the more that I have a spiritual practice, then the more I not only can enjoy what is coming about, but I also know that I influence what is coming about and how it is coming about. So when we say no more struggle, no more strife, with my faith I see the light, We're talking about we don't have to effort life into being and we don't have to resist what is trying to happen. We do have to remain mindful and aware and open and receptive. And we remember with that seed that these squiggly little things that are coming out of us is, oh, it's okay. It's really okay. This is life becoming more. There's a wonderful passage from one of my very favorite authors, Dr. Howard Thurman, and he speaks to this idea, speaking with a friend of mine who's going through some things, and, and he's wise enough to know that, I said, you know, gosh, I just wish I could wave my magic wand and have it go away, and he said, don't do that. This is my struggle. That how wonderful, how beautiful, how, can, how aware is that to recognize in the struggle is also the possibility. And I was reminded of a passage from Dr. Howard Thurman And um, it's from a passage he calls The Value of Struggle. And it says this. It was a beautiful little garden just out the dining room window. With the simplicity, simplicity characteristic of him, my friend gave me the names and explained the habits of life of various plants growing there. I was struck by what was said about the little bush which grew near the steps. This plant is called Daphne. It is not doing well here because it is too comfortably situated. The soil is too rich and it gets too much protection. This plant tends to go to wood and leaves with very, very poor blossoms if it is placed where it does not have to struggle. The aim of all plants is to reproduce themselves by making seeds. Poor soil challenges this particular plant, making it conserve its strength and concentrate it on the main business, the production of blossoms, which in turn become seeds, the guarantee of the perpetuation of its own kind. Then the silence fell while my mind took wings. An easy life devoid of challenge, too much protection, scatters the energy, dissipates the resources, works against singleness of mind, without which there can be no real fulfillment. You see, I love that passage because it reminds me that sometimes there's tremendous value in struggle. That struggle that comes when we are in that place of letting go of who we thought we were in order to be who we truly are. Don't let anyone kid you about the spiritual journey. It's not all joy and light. There are dark places that get to be visited along the way. But you see, that's so that we can uncover the truth of who we are. And so this idea of Daphne being in soil that's too rich. Because really, don't we all just want to live in rich soil? I mean, really? (laughs) Not too much stuff. But in this idea that it is the challenge of life that brings forth the fruit. It is the challenge of confronting who we are. And what I have found with my life, it may or may not be true for you, but when I get too comfortable because I have a soul's journey apparently, life says, no, no, you're not growing. And you made a commitment to grow. 
I don't know if you've noticed this, but usually growth does not play, take place when we're comfortable. And often, um, when we're growing, it ain't comfortable, right? It's unknown. But when we have a faith in a power greater than we are, when we have a faith in an, and an awareness of the one life as our life that is always and forever whole and perfect and complete, then we see the impermanence of things. We see that life is constantly evolving, constant changing, and yet there is an eternal something that remains the same. That same little ball of love that you showed up with in six or eight pounds all these years ago has changed and evolved in outer, but there's a way that we always know a person is the same. So I'm looking at these pictures of these kids, of David showing up 30 years later going, dude, you grew up, right? No, I've seen him many times, but right? I know it's him. There's an intelligence, even though physically we're not the same. So what I would say to you on this day is that you are spiritually magnificent. Not because anything you've earned, not because of anything you've done, but because that is the divine birthright. But each of us is awakening to that spiritual magnificence. Each of us is allowing that. And whether you're in a state of flow right now or a state of struggle, welcome the journey. It's all designed and serving your highest potential to be realized in the world. Let us pray. As we breathe into this moment, as we recognize that indeed there is but one life, one power, one presence, one infinite being, and as we celebrate the fact that the one life expresses itself in and through and as all of creation, and therefore, it must celebrate itself in and through us right here and right now. We breathe into this moment. We open our mind to divine wisdom. We open our hearts to unconditional love. We allow this divine intelligence to give sway to our life. There is no need to effort, only to allow. And so we allow more of the divine to be realized in us and through us and as us. We accept the divine inheritance that has been given. We know that we are spiritually magnificent beings right here and right now. And because all that is true for the whole must be true for the parts, we know those qualities of spirit of wholeness, of love, of joy, of harmony, of abundance are already ours. And so we breathe into that awareness and we call forth the presence of divine love. We know that this unconditional love is the, is the creative force but also the healing presence that allows us to experience our greater self, that allows us to fully and freely forgive, to see beyond the appearance of things, to recognize spiritual truth. It allows us to heal and transform what has been. We recognize the presence of wholeness revealing itself as what health and well-being, as vitality, calling that forth through every cell and every system. We hold that awareness of wholeness as our birthright. We recognize right here and right now that we are abundant beings because we live in an abundant presence. The source and substance of all that is comes from but one source. And so we allow greater good to be revealed in our lives. We joyously give and, and generously receive a divine bounty. In truth, none of it is ours. It is simply the divine and we have use of it. So we can be in a state of flow and grace. 
We're giving thanks in this moment for the inner recognition of the truth of who we are. And we allow that awareness to anchor more deeply into our being, into our soul. As I speak this word of truth, I'm simply giving thanks. I'm giving thanks for the many blessings in our lives, those seen and those yet to be realized, the blessings of spirit, the blessings of form, And I know that as we experience that gratitude and blessing for ourselves, we want to extend that. We bless this spiritual community knowing that it is a divine idea unfolding. That it is continuing to evolve into its greater yet to be. We bless our brothers and sisters all across the world. We're recognizing the humanity the brotherhood and the sisterhood of all humanity. We're holding a high vision for a world that works for all, for a planet at peace, for a planet in harmony with itself. How grateful I am to bear witness to this truth. And so as is our custom and our tradition, we take a moment to bless all priests, rabbis, ministers, teachers of every faith, For we know there are many pathways to the divine. We give thanks that where two or more are gathered, there's a greater recognition of the I am, and that is good. So in joy and gratitude, we're simply giving thanks in this moment for all of the blessings. I'm knowing that as we come together in this moment in high consciousness, we are holding that consciousness and it is acted upon by a law of mind which I'm grateful for for it brings forth the highest good for all concern in perfect timing and in divine right order in joy and gratitude then I'm just giving thanks allowing it to be so as together we say and so it is